Welcome to the listener's commentary on the New Testament. Your guide is pastor and theologian Dr. John Whitaker, and the heart behind these studies is to help you better understand the text of Scripture so you can more fully live it out. It's all about helping you learn and live the Bible. Here is the book of Colossians. All right, welcome to the listener's commentary on Paul's letter to the Colossians. And as a letter, we already obviously know some things. We assume some things about it just by that title, Paul's letter to the Colossians. But letters always uh, have a backstory. There's always a relationship between the sender and the recipient. And there's usually some situation that informs the content of the letter. And that's true with the biblical letters as well. And so before we jump into the actual text of Paul's letter to Colossians, let's just talk about the backstory a little bit and make sure we at least understand who the players are in this letter and what the situation is, at least as best as we can discern it. All right. And so um, it's Paul's letter to the Colossians. What, what do we mean by the Colossians? Well, we're talking about the church in the city of Colossae. So what do we know about the city of Colossae? Well, Colossae was a town located a roughly about a hundred miles east of the major city of Ephesus. Ephesus was one of the top cities of the Greco-Roman Empire, and Colossae was a town about a hundred miles to the east of that in what is now modern-day Turkey. And uh, Ephesus sat right on the coast, and so we're about a hundred miles inland from the western coast of modern-day Turkey. You can look it up on a map and see exactly where it's at. And it was in a rather fertile valley region that uh, we refer to as the Lycus Valley, L-Y-C-U-S, Lycus Valley, that was uh, noted for lush green hills. And it had some neighboring towns that were part of the same region, Laodicea and Hierapolis. And those cities actually get mentioned in this letter as well, 413. And so... Colossae is this town here, and in its history, it had actually been at the junction of two major highways, one from Sardis, one from Ephesus, that uh, represented the major junction on the road to the east. But the, the highway from Sardis was moved at a different point in history, and so Colossae kind of lost some of its prominence. And by the time we get to Paul's day, the first century, Colossae is actually described by a uh, a, a first century geographer as a small town. So it's not a major city. It's not a commercial center. It's not a social center. It's a smaller town inland from the city of Ephesus. And it was primarily made up of uh, native Phrygians and Greeks, Phrygian being the region that it's in, and Greeks. And so um, pr predominantly Gentile families, although um, in the second century BC, there was sort of a migration of Jewish families into the area. And so by, by Paul's time, uh, it had a decent sized Jewish population. That's important too for what we see going on in the letter. And so what you get in Colossae is sort of a smaller town with a decent Jewish population um, and kind of a variety of cultural and religious elements that had mingled together in sort of a hodgepodge of ideas and beliefs. And it seems like that may be at least some of the kind of the cultural context that informs what's going on in the letter that we'll talk about here in a little bit. And this is Paul's letter to the Colossians, which means it's written by Paul to the church in the city of Colossae. We know that because right at the beginning, verse 1, Paul says, Paul, an apostle, right? So he tells us he's writing. He mentions himself again in chapter 1, verse 23, when he describes his ministry, and he says, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. And then again at the very end, while he, when he signs off in chapter 4, verse 18, Paul mentions himself. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. And so um, uh, Paul himself is the author of Colossians. And yes, there have been scholars in the last hundred or so years that have debated that. But prior to those scholars, no one ever debated that. It fits with Paul's character. It fits with the history of the times. It's closely uh, tied to the book of Philemon, which no one doubts to be from the hand of Paul. And so Colossians is written by the Apostle Paul to the church in the city of Colossae. When was it written? And that's a good question. Traditionally, it was written during Paul's imprisonment in Rome. Uh, 
Paul actually mentions to remember his change. So we know he's under arrest. He's in some sort of incarceration. We're not exactly sure when is the problem, but traditionally it was when Paul was in prison in Rome. And that would put the writing of this letter in the early 60s, 60 to 61, when Paul was in prison there. But that's the traditional dating. People have made a case for earlier incarcerations, Ephesus or others, and so that's probably when it was written. And so we don't know 100%, but the traditional identification is early 60s while Paul's in prison in Rome. Now, let's tell you the story. What's going on that motivates this letter? What's the back story with all these preliminary facts in mind? What, what do we know for certain? Well, we know this, that the church in Colossae wasn't started by the Apostle Paul. It was an outgrowth of his ministry, but he himself didn't start it, and in fact, he had never been there. The church was started by a man named Epaphras, who Paul describes in chapter 1 of this letter as a faithful servant of Christ. And he is the one who started the church in Colossae and probably also the churches in Laodicea and Hierapolis, according to 413, that he worked hard for those churches as well. So it seems as if Epaphras um, was maybe trained by Paul and then sent out by Paul into this region, and he started churches in Laodicea, Hierapolis, and our city here, Colossians, Colossae. Um, that most likely happened during Paul's third missionary journey when Paul was stationed in Ephesus for a long period of time. He was there for two plus years or so, teaching, the book of Acts tells us in Acts 19, at what's called as the School of Tyrannus, some sort of lecture hall that Paul presumably rented out in Ephesus where he did some teaching and some training. And so as a result of that, he now has trained up some other workers for kingdom ministry and he sends one of them out, Epaphras, into this region, Colossae and the neighboring towns. And uh, Epaphras started churches there in, in that region. Now, as we said, Paul is under some sort of incarceration, and traditionally that's identified with Rome, and he's awaiting trial of some sort, and Epaphras visits Paul. And when he does, he shares the progress of the gospel in Colossae and the surrounding region. He also presumably shares the problems going on at Colossae, that the church really needs greater grounding in the gospel, greater grounding in Christ. They need encouragement to grow to maturity in Christ. And it seems as if there, there was some sort of teaching that is at least in some way challenging, subverting their stability in Christ and their sufficiency in Christ. This teaching has traditionally been referred to as the Colossian heresy. I don't know why scholars give things these names. It probably wasn't called that in Paul's day. That's just our way of labeling it. And we don't even know how extensive it was and how big it was, but there was at least from Paul's perception, some sort of uh, challenge to their stability and sufficient, uh, sufficiency in Christ. And so Paul gets word from Epaphras as what's going on, and then he is going to write back and just encourage them, tell them uh, about how sufficient Jesus is, try to ground them in that, and help them grow to maturity in Christ. And in doing so, he seems to uh, address the situation, this teaching that was challenging that. So imagine this. Imagine you're sitting in your living room at home or in your apartment and your husband or your wife or maybe just your roommate, good friend who lives with you, gets a phone call and they answer the phone call and they start talking on the phone. And what do you do? Well, if you're like me, what you do is you're trying to figure out, well, who, who, are, who are they talking to? Who's on the other end of the line? And you listen to what your, your roommate or your spouse says. And as they are talking, you begin to realize, oh, I think they're talking to Oh, that's what they're talking about. And because you know some things about their relationship and, the, and what's going on in the other person's life, you can piece together from your end of the phone call what's going on in the other end of the phone call, right? Well, that's sort of what you have to do with New Testament letters. As we read these uh, letters of Paul or Peter or John, we are listening to one end of the phone conversation, one, in, one side of the conversation, and we're trying to infer, piece together what's going on on the other side of the line. And so let me read you just a little snippet from Colossians chapter 2. That's one side, Paul's side of the conversation. And with that, let's infer what's going on a little bit at Colossae. Listen to these words. Colossians chapter 2 verse 16 says this. 
Therefore, let no one act as your judge in regard to food or uh, drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Well, if you know anything about their world, when we talk food, drink, festival, new moon, or Sabbath day, we're talking about food laws among the Jews. We're talking about the ritual calendar among the Jews, the Sabbath, the monthly gathering, the new moon, festivals, their ritual holiday feasts of the Jews, right? So there's some sort of Jewish thing going on here. And Paul says, don't let anyone be your judge in regard to that stuff. Those things are a mere shadow of what was to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And then he goes on in verse 18 and says, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize, by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on things he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, who doesn't hold fast to the head from whom the entire body is held together and grows with a growth which is from God. So as you listen to that and you hear what Paul says, then you have to infer, okay, well, they're experiencing some sort of judgment. They're experiencing some sort of questioning. They're experiencing somebody defrauding them and judging them in regard to Jewish festivals, Jewish rituals, somebody defrauding them in regard to self-abasement, which means like ascetic practices, lowering of, you know, self-lowering in a way to kind of make yourself open to spiritual things, worship of angels, and somebody taking their stand on some sort of ecstatic visions they have seen or something like that. That's what's going on in Colossae, right? As we listen to Paul's side of the conversation, we infer, oh, I, I think I begin to see what's going on. So what exactly is it? And as I said, scholars have labeled this the Colossian heresy, which is probably a little bit of an overstatement, but there's something going on, and it sounds like there's some sort of elitist, exclusivist attitude, right? Like he's defrauding you, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. If you really want to experience uh, God himself, and you know, you want to be as awesome and spiritual as me, well, you need to, right? You need to do these things. And so there's some sort of exclusive elitist attitude that involves Judaism to some degree, right? He's He mentions the, the holy days. He mentions the food and drink, the Jewish dietary laws later or elsewhere in chapter 2, a little bit above that in 2.11. He references circumcision. And so there's definitely some sort of Jewish component, which is probably the lion's share of it. Um, he mentions this self-abasement, and we, we learn a little bit later that he talks about things don't handle, don't taste, don't touch, right? Like where there's all these rules about food. And so there's some sort of like ascetic element where like harsh treatment of the body he mentions and some of that. And so like really, you know, kind of <clears throat> stern, harsh treatment of the body and ascetic element. He even refers to it sort of as a, a philosophy, which could just be a way of referring to Judaism. We see other ancient writers doing that or maybe some sort of mystical or philosophical element, this taking a stand on visions he has seen, worship of angels. That seems to be what's combined going on here in in Colossae. So what is that? Well, again, the traditional answer, probably not the best answer, has been what's called Gnosticism, secret knowledge and all that. But full-blown Gnosticism didn't really show up until about a hundred years after the time Paul writes this letter. So it certainly couldn't have been full-blown Gnosticism where there was like, you know, you're you're saved by your secret knowledge and all of that. Now, but that didn't grow out of a vacuum. So certainly there were roots of that earlier on before full-blown Gnosticism. Maybe, you know, maybe that's what's going on in Colossae. Probably not the best answer, but there's certainly something like that. Others have said some sort of, you know, Jewish like Dead Sea Scroll apocalyptism type thing where it's like we're looking for the end of the world and we're going to we're trying to get you to say you got to withdraw from the world and so the and, and practice Judaism real sternly and well there's certainly some sort of Jewish sternness going on others have said some sort of Jewish mysticism and then maybe that's sort of the better thing where in Jewish some versions of Jewish mysticism you know you had to be ritually pure you had to keep you know the the feasts and all of that you had to deny yourself of bodily comforts. And then not only that, that some of them actually had like um, angels that were over like different realms that you kind of needed to be in good standing with so you could pass through those realms and eventually have like a full experience of God. And so maybe it's some sort of Jewish mysticism like that. The fact is, is we don't know exactly what it is. We can guess and infer based on what we know about the culture of the day. What we do know is there was a strong Jewish element to it and some sort of connection with some sort of mystical practices, it sounds like. And 
Paul's like, you don't need that. You don't need that. Um, and that's really at the heart of this letter is Paul's advice and challenge, sternness to the, the Colossian church is like, no, no, if you have Jesus, you have the fullness of God. You don't need to go looking for the fullness of God. If you have Jesus, you've been made complete in him. You've been given fullness in him. So you have everything you need. And that's really the major theme of this letter of Colossians is Christ is all you need. Christ is everything. In Christ, you have all you need. You need no supplements. You don't need any add-ons. You don't need Christ plus anything. You don't need Christ and anything. If you have Jesus, you have the very fullness of God in him, and you have been made full, complete in Christ himself. And that's at the heart of this letter. That's Paul's major message. And so we'll see this great tribute to Christ early on in the letter. We'll see Paul reminding them of, look, you entered into Christ by faith and baptism. And, and so now you have the very fullness of Jesus. You have everything that God has to offer. Stand firm in that. And so he works to get them rooted and planted in Jesus, growing to maturity in Jesus, because in Jesus, they have the very fullness of God himself. And that's such an important message even for us today where it's so easy for us to think, I need something more. I need a greater religious experience. I need, you know, I need some sort of ecstatic experience. I need greater devotional experiences. I need whatever it is. I need, you know, Jesus plus social justice, whatever it is. All these different things that we can add to Jesus. And Paul's point is, Let's stick with Jesus. Let's learn from Jesus. Let's listen to Jesus. Jesus is the mature man. He's the full, genuine, authentic human being. He's the real deal. Let's become mature in him. And so uh, as those who are followers of Jesus today, the message really is the same to us. Let's, let's put our roots down deep into Jesus. Let's sink our life down deep into him. Let's learn from him. And as we do so, we will find that we have everything that God has to offer because it's found right there in Jesus. Okay, there you have it. That's the backstory to Paul's letter to the Colossians. With that, in our next session, we will jump into the introduction and greeting in chapter 1.